Witam Was na kolejnym spotkaniu z cyklu Czasy Ekonomiczne. Dzisiaj drugi dzień z Bretem Scottem z Londynu, aktywistą, byłym brokerem, który miał okazję wejść swego czasu w świat finansów jako, jako właśnie pracownik jednej z firm finansowych, a dzisiaj opowie nam trochę o mechanizmach, które rządzą, rządzą światowymi rynkami i finansami, bankowością i też być może dowiemy się, jak rzucić wyzwanie tym mechanizmom w kreatywny sposób. Więc zapraszam wszystkich na godzinę, półtorej godziny z Bretem Scottem. Oczywiście będzie czas na pytania i odpowiedzi po prezentacji. Um, hello, I'm Brett Scott. W were any of you, I recognize some of you from yesterday. Were, who was here yesterday? Okay, so uh, some of you know who I am then. Um, <coughs> for those of you who don't, um, I'm the author of this book here called The Heretic's Guide to Global Finance, Hacking the Future of Money. Um, this is a kind of a, a guide to the financial sector and financial activism and alternative finance. Um, Uh, yesterday I spoke a bit about alternative currencies, so it was more on the sort of alternative finance front, sort of alternatives to mainstream finance. Um, today I've been asked to talk a bit more about mainstream finance or the kind of the financial sector. Um, and it's kind of a, a, as I've interpreted it, to try and demystify to some extent and then maybe talk about some kind of campaigns around finance that I've been involved in. Um, and is that basically correct? Okay, cool. But we can, we, can, we can kind of push it in different directions depending on what you're most interested in. Because to be honest, finance is um, too big a topic to cover in an hour and a half. So there's, there's limits to what we can actually do. Um, so if there's particular things you're more interested in, we can try and steer it that way. I'm going to start though by trying to go through a whole bunch of stuff, a, a basic overview of, of um, components of the financial system. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that a lot of you, I'm going to assume a fairly beginner, beginner level. Um, if there are some of you who know quite a lot about finance already, then um, please forgive me. But um, first of all, what do you guys, when you think of the word, uh, when you think of finance, uh, what images come to your mind? Like jump into your head, visual imagery. Money, okay. What else? Wall Street, City of London, okay. This, this, is, mo this is most people's um, visual perception of what finance is. So a lot of stuff around guys in suits, big buildings, frequently mathematics is an element of what people think. Um, and then there's kind of like this sort of this combination of numbers and money and stuff. It's often this quite sort of jumbled uh, idea Um, I should also add that I've actually worked in the financial sector, so that's one thing I should say. Um, so I've had some experience with how it works. Um, I will, one point I want to make about these images here is these images frequently actually distract you. Um, they're often not very useful to be thinking of finance in this way. Um, this is an element of the financial system, but uh, I'm, I always advocate that you should, when you're thinking about finance, you should try and start from much simpler... Um, more basic um, position. So this is this is how I like to start thinking about about finance. Um, that's the planet Mars. Um, <coughs> anyway, uh, the reason I do this is, is I, I, the question I want people to, to think about is like, uh, what is the economy? Like, what? How would you create an economy on Mars? What would you have to do if you were arriving there from scratch? So uh, when I'm getting people to think about the financial system, I always think you know you should. We always get we always assume it's this incredibly, uh, it is a powerful industry and it's always this very, um, but it has too much too much weight in people's minds. The financial sector cannot exist without agriculture. Agriculture is a much more important element of an economy than a financial system is, um, and this is because you die without agriculture. So it's a good way to ground yourself. Whenever you're trying to think about these issues, just go back down to basics. Um, think about what is the economy actually based on. It's based on people making real things like food, for example. And it's a good place to start. And finance only comes later as a concept in, a, in, in an economy. 
Um, but you first have to have these more basic things. So I just, uh, you know, I, I, I throw it in there to kind of like uh, dispel some sort of those, those images. Um, here's some other basic things. You know, people, people produce things and then people find ways of giving stuff away or exchanging them. You know, there's, you might you produce stuff and then you give it away or you exchange it with somebody else. Um, these are the basic elements of what we call the economy. Production, exchange, and then consumption, eating that stuff or using it in some ways. And that is what we call, quote unquote, economics. Finance, is, as it comes, uh, comes at a later stage of this, uh, finance is often a process whereby you've accumulated a bunch of stuff and then the financial sector emerges in, in, in societies where there's been high levels of accumulation of goods. And then, try, then it's trying to redistribute these goods into new investments. Um, but it cannot exist without all this stuff first. Um, uh, so I'm now I'm going to go into the more sort of financy stuff. Um, what do we use for exchange? To facilitate exchange. Oh, I'll put it up there. Money. Okay. Um, I've also put a definition of what I think money is. Um, claims and goods and services. Uh, yesterday we had, a whole we had a whole discussion on money, so I'm not sure I want to go into that today. But this is quite a good way, to just a, quite a simple, basic explanation of, of, of how to think about money to start off with. Um, it's about what you can do with it. Uh, you can use money to claim goods and services from people. The first, the first kind of way, I guess, that, that, that we think about the financial system, its first sort of quote-unquote function... Um, oh, wait, I want to go, I wanna go back. Um, <laughs> This, this here is also how a lot of people think about money w visually when they're thinking about it in their heads. So we have this system of exchange. Um, visually, people imagine this often as, as what money is in society. Um, uh, this uh, actual physical money like this makes up a very small percentage of the money supply in any society. It's like data center entries in, in uh, big commercial banks. So we, uh, this is a, a, an important kind of... Um, it's, it's quite hard to, to sort of get these images out of people's heads and, and replace them with things like this. This is actually how, how the monetary system works here. Um, so, okay, we, we have the, the basic economy, and we have a monetary system. So now, and we can talk about more about those in specific if we want, but like, let me go into like now finance. Um, so this is the, the first way we might describe finance, and this looks a little bit complicated probably, but this can describe quite a lot about what finance is. Um, so basically, the first line is money, claims on, on claims on goods and services, or claims on future resources, are steered via financial intermediaries, such as banks and big funds, all right, and financial instruments, such as shares and bonds, into ex investments in exchange for a return. Now this formula here is there's flaws to this, but this is basically, you can describe many situations in the financial sector with this. So for example, um, I don't know how many of you might have pension funds, but a pension fund, for example, is a financial intermediary. You're steering money via this financial intermediary. That financial intermediary goes and buys um, shares and bonds, which are in turn steering money into investments somewhere in the world. It's then extracting value back from those investments in the form of interest or dividends. They're going back to the, the fund and they're going back, to, going back out. And you can, you can imagine that's a financial circuit. Okay? Does that basically make sense? Okay, so that, a lot of finance has this basic structure to it. Um, I put the word created there in the second line. It's a bit confusing um, because um, a, lot of traditional, a lot of traditional ways people explain finance is um, you take um, excess money. So, for example, you've saved money and then it's steered by the financial sector into investments and then you get returns back. But actually, the idea that the financial sector merely steers money around is a bit, is a bit erroneous. It actually... Um, uh, banks are frequently... There's a process of they actually creating new claims in the economy, but we can... Just for now, hold this basic model in your head. Um, <coughs> so the first kind of like a set of financial intermediaries um, I thought I'd go through are commercial banks. I'm just going to flick through the main, the main things you should kind of like have a, some sense of. Um, commercial banks are what most people have some, some notion of them in society. I mean, the basic idea of what commercial banks are theoretically supposed to do is to take people's deposits and then be pushing them into, in the form of credit, out into the, into the rest of the economy in form of loans. Okay, there's, 
that's a slightly dubious way of me explaining it. But uh, here you basically have uh, damn. somebody puts a deposit into a bank. It's being recorded in those commercial data centers. Um, and then it's been pushed out into investments in the form of credit on the other side here. Um, so that, for example, is a mining project, an oil project. Um, so banks are lending huge amounts of money to these projects. Um, and people on the other side are depositing. Now, this is a very basic model of banking. You shouldn't take this too seriously. This is, this is quite a traditional way people look at, look at banks. Um, actually, banks doing a lot of other things in the, in the, middle, in the middle of there. Um, and banks also engage in something called fractional reserve banking, um, which means that they, they actually lend out a lot more money than they actually get in deposits, um, which is a, a source of lots of controversy um, in in many circles. Um, a, lo a large amount of money in society is created via this process. Um, but just as a basic model, this is a lot of what banks are doing. And there's a lot of controversy around this in many other ways as well, because um, banks lend in a highly unsustainable way. Uh, so these are some friends of mine in, in Amsterdam called BankTrack, um, or the Netherlands. And they basically specialize in trying to track where banks actually lend their money. Um, and I don't know how well you can see there, but there's examples of Canadian tar sands, um, coal power plants, and um, banks have, have historically had very unsustainable lending practices. But a lot of people who are put depositing their money in the banks don't ever really think about this or don't actually have any, have any idea where the banks actually lend money. Um, so I'll talk a bit later about a campaign I've been involved in around this type of stuff. Um, here's just as an example, here are some banks that lend into the Canadian tar sands projects, um, highly unsustainable um, projects and these are just some of the banks who are involved in, in uh, lending money to to those projects um, many of them very sort of respectable global banks which have this sort of responsible face um, but in the background they're engaged in um, very unsustainable practices this this commercial bank here is actually investing in stuff look it actually lends money to two things it's it's engaging in investments it's a, it's a called debt investment so uh, commercial banks directly lend um, whereas investment banks never actually directly lend to people investment banks basically specialize in getting other people to lend so they arrange deals. They arrange for investors to lend money to projects or else to invest in the form of shares in projects. Um, and that's the first function of most investment banks. So I'm going to show you the basic um, idea there. Um, notice in this situation, Goldman Sachs is not lending to this, to this uh, project. Let's say that's BHP Billiton, a big, a big global uh, mining company or, or, or so, you know, whoever that is. Um, Goldman Sachs doesn't do the lending. Goldman Sachs specializes in finding investors to invest in that company. Um, and that's basically the, the first original function of investment banks was this. And it used to be called things like merchant banking and other names. But this, the, the idea is you'd find a bunch of investors, you'd convince them to, to give money to other people, and you would vouch for this project. You'd say, we think you should be putting your money into this, and we're going to basically underwrite this. We're going to uh, give you confidence to do it. And the instruments that they use to do it, they create these, these legal um, financial instruments called shares and bonds um, to facilitate that. Um, I don't know how much you guys know about shares and bonds. Uh, a bond is just, a, is just a, a, a way of lending to a company. So if you get investors to go via a bond into, into that um, investment there, they're lending to that, that company. And what comes back to investors, if you, if you lend to a company, what comes back is interest. You get interest back. If you invest as a, as, as a, as a, as a share investor, you get dividends back. So there's, they're both steering money into a company, but there's just different, different legal forms and different rights as, as an investor. Like Goldman Sachs doesn't have time to be phoning people like, you know, you and me here. They're like, you know, we're not interested. It's too small. We'll, we'll only deal with big funds who are in turn picking up money from people like you. Um, so those big funds are people like this. We call them institutional investors. And huge amounts of money that flow into the stock markets and into all the projects around the world are from these types of investors. Um, so some examples, BlackRock, that's a huge fund management company. Um, they basically run things called mutual funds, um, for example, where you can put money into a mutual fund, a BlackRock mutual fund, and it'll go and do investment on your behalf. Okay. Um, there's a few other examples here. There's an interesting one there, um, Adia, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. Have you guys heard of sovereign wealth funds? 
Uh, these are basically funds that take the, the surplus money of, 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 of countries and invest it on their behalf. So sovereign wealth funds have huge amounts of money that they invest. Um, that one over there is USS. That's a, a, um, the university teachers pension fund in the UK. Um, and it's a huge investor. Uh, it has about 54 billion in, in investments. Um, the little one on the bottom there, Thames River, is something called a hedge fund. Okay, so it's a small, well, it's quite big, but they're, they're unregulated. They don't have the same levels of regulations that these other types of, something like USS would. Um, so these are all funds. Um, and basically these guys, Goldman Sachs is getting them together um, and saying, you're going to lend via, you're going to either lend or you're going to invest as a share investor in, in, this, in this company. And that's basically what investment banks do as their main, their main line of business. Um, and here's an, an example um, of... This is a, a company that was privatized or part privatized a few years ago called Coal India. It's, it's the world's largest coal company. Um, it's mostly owned by the, the Indian government. Um, so you'll see in this, this, here, this is a, a screenshot of a Bloomberg terminal. This is a big uh, financial data service. Um, so you see the first shareholder in Coal India is the president of India and, uh, or it's the Indian government. They own 90%, but they sold, they basically privatized 10% of the company. Um, and the investment banks that were involved in finding the investors to, to buy these shares were Citibank, Deutsche Bank, uh, Merrill Lynch, and Morgan Stanley. And they went and found a lot of those investors there. And you can see that people, um, there's various, uh, 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 Black Rock was on there. Um, well, they're not, they're, they're, there's, there's, there's about 100 other investors after this. But the biggest ones are, are big are fund management companies. Um, so Prudential Asset Management, that's a, you know, it's a big, uh, it runs big insurance funds and investment funds. Um, so these are people who are basically investing into coal in India. Um, are there any basic questions around this one function of investment banks? Is that kind of vaguely clear? So you have commercial banks which are lending directly to these, pro these projects and then investment banks which are getting other investors to, to do that. Um, so if you ever see a story in the financial newspapers about um, you know, uh, a, a Rio Tinto or somebody is raising money via a bond, it's this kind of process with investment banks creating a bond and then getting investors to invest in them. Um, again, in terms of very unsustainable investment, investment banks are often at the forefront of arranging um, big environmentally destructive deals. Okay, second part. Um, this is what pe people, people, when they think about investment banks, often think about this, trading. You see those films like The Wolf of Wall Street and... Uh, yeah, there are all these guys shouting at each other, and there's all this like you know numbers and noise and stuff. This year, trading is a sort of a secondary thing that investment banks do. The first job, as I was sort of saying there, is this, is this, this, this money raising part, which is they're actually creating new financial instruments. This this trading element of of financial markets is a, a secondary thing. It's when financial instruments that have already been created are put into a second-hand market and, and resold and, 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 and pushed around, basically. Um, so you can imagine, for example, the first-hand market in books is where a publisher actually creates a new book and sells it to distributors and they sell it on to the public. Um, but then a second-hand bookshop is, a, is trading books. Okay, so it's a secondary process. So this, these trading markets, with, when you hear this, that's, that's what that's about. Um, these are the kind of images you get when you type into you know, Google Images. Um, <coughs> it's all these guys in like, you know, pits shouting and stuff. Um, this doesn't really help you much when you're th thinking about trading though. So, um, and I was involved in, in trading markets, so I've had quite a lot of experience with this type of stuff. I'll, so I'll try and give you just a quick basic overview of what's mostly happening. First thing to say, those guys on that side are not traders. Okay, so when you, when you ask people, there's, there's this big difference between a broker and a trader. Um, traders... Um, in investment banks are often s single people sitting behind big computers like this, quite lonely, you know, by themselves, sort of like thinking about whether, what they should buy and sell, okay? The brokers are those guys there. I used to be a broker. Um, they, they, work, they work for these guys, yeah. They work for the, the actual traders. They try and get the traders to, to, to trade among themselves. So they're kind of like agents. They try to like make markets work. Whereas the, the traders themselves are a bit more like, uh, you know, they're the ones who do the buying and the selling. Um, so a large part of what investment banks do in the trading world is what's called uh, um, a dealing. So an investment bank dealer. Um, 
They basically buy and sell from people. So they'll buy from one person and then try to sell to somebody else. So they're, 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 they're dealing, they're trying to like make markets. Um, so I'm trying to think of, think of an example. Do you guys have the, the situation where you have popular music concerts and then people go and buy tickets and try to resell them outside the concert? Do you get that in this country? Yeah, like that's, that's a dealing process. Somebody's gone and outlaid money to buy tickets that they then try to flip at the, at the, at the, outside the, the, the concert. And that's basically what investment bank dealers do. They buy financial instruments um, in the secondary markets and then try to sell them on. Okay, um, But often they get stuck with, in positions which, which they cannot actually sell what they've bought. So they use these brokers to try and find... Um, and I'll show you an example of how this works. Um, okay. So actually, remember, remember our earlier example here of Goldman Sachs has arranged this deal here and BlackRock is one of the original investors. It's gone and bought a bunch of bonds, which basically means it's lent money to, let's say this is a, a BHP bulletin. Okay. So BlackRock is holding a bunch of these, bunch of these bonds. Um, now, let's say BlackRock wants to get rid of those bonds. Um, it's actually really hard for something like BlackRock, which is this big fund management company, to know who to sell it to. You know, you're holding these bonds, but you, you're like, well, how do I find somebody to buy these from me? I don't know who, I don't know who else holds them. Or I don't know who else wants to basically uh, take them. All right. So what they'll always do, they'll go to the dealers. So they'll try to sell them to the investment banks. Um, and that's this process here. So BlackRock is holding those. It might sell to a, a bond dealer at the Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, so let's say that the bond dealer agrees to buy, buy them, but then the bond dealer doesn't want to be holding them. Or it, it wants to be selling them on to somebody else, but it doesn't have a client. It doesn't have somebody to sell them to. So they might go to those inter-dealer brokers and say, do you know any other banks, any other dealers who want to buy this from me? And the inter-dealer brokers are phoning all the banks and saying, we have, so we have somebody who wants to basically uh, be s to sell bonds. Do you want to buy them? Um, on the other side, a bank like Socgen, Societe Generale, might have somebody who wants to buy bonds, all right? But they can't find those bonds. So they might, they might go via those, those brokers in the middle and say, okay, sure, we'll buy them from whoever you, you're representing. Um, and the end, the end point of this is that BlackRock sells via those two dealers and it ends up in a hedge fund called Thames, Re Thames River Capital. Okay, so the, the brokers are working between those banks to then, and then the banks themselves have their own clients who they're trying to sell to or buy to buy from. Okay, and this is quite an important part of financial markets. This, this middle section there with the inter-dealer brokers and, and the banks is what they call the interbank markets. And it's a huge element of financial markets is banks dealing among themselves and then going out to the... Uh, during, during the financial crisis, a big part of what actually happened was the interbank markets um, where those inter-dealer brokers are, they all seized up. And all, as, those inter -bank, as the bank markets seize up, all the other stuff collapses as well. Um, so I won't... We don't have to go into that, but that's it's that's basically what's happening a lot of this trading. Um, okay, I don't, I I want to go into the last slightly complicated section um, and um, derivatives. Okay, who wants to explain derivatives? So so see, we looked at the first the first two things we went through. We 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 gone through bank, basically investment banks and commercial banks facilitating the process of money being raised. Okay, so money into an investment. Then there was a second thing, which was secondary trading of those financial instruments that have been created. Okay, so those are two sort of separate things in financial markets. It's quite possible to use a bet to protect yourself. For, for example, I'm trying to think of, uh, this, is not, this is like not a perfect example, but imagine you're, a, a, you're a, an owner of a horse on a horse racing track. Okay, you might actually enter into a bet against your horse as a way to protect yourself from your horse maybe losing in, that, in a race. So let's say you'll make money if your horse wins, um, but you'll then lose money on that bet. Alternatively, if your horse loses, you'll make money on your bet. So you've actually protected yourself. There's a kind of, that, that's, what's, that's what they refer to in financial markets as hedging. So it's the use of bets to protect yourself. Okay? But you can do exactly the same thing and not have a horse. So you could be a pure speculator. Just betting, normally. So it's true that derivative markets have what's called a risk management function, so a way of trying to protect risk. 
but also there's a huge risk amplification thing because uh, I mean, for example, the horse betting markets are uh, uh, horse bets are effectively are horse derivatives. Okay. Um, and the idea of the derivative is it derives its value from something. So like a horse bet derives its value from a race that's happening down there. So the, peop the people enter into a bet here and they say, well, we'll base what the outcome of this bet on something else. We're deriving the value of this bet from that horse race. Okay? So that's, that's the, uh, the notion of the derivative. Um, in the case of financial markets, they're not dealing with horse bets. They're dealing with large-scale bets on things like interest rates, um, uh, commodities prices, share prices, all sorts of stuff. And there's different kind of financial uh, uh, derivatives you can use to do that. We don't have to go into the details of the particular types, but I'm just going to, uh, I was supposed to show this here. Um, that, that guy there is a, in, in English, they often call, they often call bookies, okay? guys who take bets from people. Yeah, so it's a person who, who enters into bets with different people. All right, so they, you know, they'll bet, somebody bets against something and then they'll pass it on to somebody else. And that's what investment bank dealers do again. So investment bank derivative dealers doing, are doing exactly that. So they enter into one bet uh, with, with one client and they try to offset it against another client. And they try to make money in the middle. Okay, just like a, book me, a, a bookie in a, in a racetrack does. So here's an example of... <coughs> okay, ABM Amro is a bit of a dead bank, but um, that's an example of their interest rate swap uh, trading platform. So if you want to protect yourself against changes in interest rates or you want to bet on changes in interest rates in the world, you can go to ABN Amro or used to be able to go to, go to them and enter into bets on those with them. Um, and actually, interest rate swaps are the world's biggest derivative market by far. Okay, we don't have to go into that, but it's basically giant bets on, on, on interest rates on changes in the, in the price of money, effectively. Um, there's lots of other types of derivatives. Um, we don't have that much time to go into them. But, you know, for example, there's, during the financial crisis, a very, a very big type of derivative was betting on the likelihood of companies failing, which is called credit default swaps. That was, that was a big one. Um, also, things like um, currency, betting on the changes in currency exchange rates. Um, betting on commodity prices. I, I, I did a whole financial campaign on, uh, against commodity price betting, um, which I can talk about a bit later. Um, uh, <coughs> there's also very, very niche ones, people betting on, on changes in the weather. So uh, um, do you guys know Enron? That, uh, they basically pioneered the market in weather derivatives, which is basically betting on whether there's going to be a hurricane or not, or whether there's going to be uh, how much rain there would be at a certain time, um, and trying to create markets in these bets. Um, so yeah, there's, <coughs> there's, there's a lot of quote-unquote creativity that can go into creating these. Um, I personally was involved for a while in something called property derivatives, which are bets on prices of property, um, inflation derivatives, which are bets on inflation, and longevity derivatives. Who, who wants to make a guess on what longevity derivatives are? Longevity, I don't know, if, or, or mortality, mortality derivatives. Bets on how long people live for, basically. And they're used by big pension funds and insurance companies who have a lot of problems with people living longer, basically. Because they, uh, big pension funds um, and insurance funds, they've got a lot, of, a lot of risk to people's, how long people live for. But something like longevity derivatives, these were ideas that banks were putting out, but they actually were really, really hard to actually create markets in these things because these are very trying to you know this sounds bizarre but you know trying to bet on how long people live for is actually incredibly it's it's morally dubious in some ways depending on who you are because actually pension funds will often argue we actually we really need to do this because we're in trouble otherwise um but uh but also it's really hard to actually calculate what what the, how you would price that or you know like it's, there's a lot of real problems with these markets um so anyway we can talk about the derivative markets um, I don't want to linger, I want to talk for uh, 10 minutes or so on some financial campaigns, so I want to just maybe move on. Um, so those are some, some big areas you could think about. There's also other areas of the financial markets as well. There's insurance, there's all sorts of other stuff, but like this is maybe what we can, we can focus on um, for now. Um, derivative markets are really controversial and there's lots of problems with them. Um, 
So I'm going to go on quickly now to the last 10 minutes of my talk here on financial campaigns I'm involved in. So I've been involved in like a lot of financial campaigns. So this is with NGOs and activist groups in London, especially um, uh, working on trying to improve the financial system in various ways. Um, so one of the first ones, um, which I helped, I was in the original team of this. It was called Move Your Money UK. Um, I'm trying to think. This was at sort of uh, early 2012 we started this. Um, and this was a simple commercial banking campaign. All right? It was not about investment banks necessarily. It was on commercial banks. It was about um, the big UK um, uh, commercial banks and, they, and the fact that they basically screwed their customers, um, invested unsustainably, and were dominating the UK economy and political scene. So we, we launched this campaign on getting people to move their money out of, out of these banks and into smaller banks, um, more sustainable banks, which unfortunately there's not actually that many of these smaller sustainable banks. So it's quite hard getting people to, to move to them. But a large part of the campaigns was you know, us going and doing these types of stunts. This is uh, Danny. She was one of the original people who started the campaign. Um, involved lots of cutting of cards of people like Barclays Bank. Um, lots of media stunts. Um, and this was quite a successful campaign. It's still going on, actually. Uh, it's, got, it's got a permanent staff now. Um, and there's actually quite a few of these types of ethical or, or, or sort of getting people to move their money, um, these types of campaigns around the world. Right now in Australia, actually, there's quite a successful one going on. Um, and uh, again, it focused on banks that invest in fossil fuel, a lot of fossil fuel uh, and, and, and climate change um, creating projects. Um, so there's a group called Market Forces in Australia um, who are running this campaign, and they've been quite successful. Um, it's actually really hard to get people to move their money, though. Uh, people are very conservative about their money, and trying to convince them that, that the, where they put their, put their money and which banks actually has an impact on the world is really hard. People are very... They, they don't want to part with their, with their bank. They've often been with their banks for many years, and they often don't question anything about them. Um, and so we've, it was quite, quite challenging, this, this campaign. Um, but we can go into that a bit later. <coughs> um, a more recent campaign I'm on, uh, this, this picture here I've just done recently, this is a new thing I'm launching. Um, but a fossil, uh, a student, student campaigns around fossil free divestment. Um, how much, do you guys know about the sort of divestment movements at all? Um, so there's a lot of, uh, a pioneer, especially by a group called 350.org um, in the States, a lot of student groups trying to get their university um, investment funds or university endowments to get their money out of fossil fuel companies um, or, or unsustainable companies. Um, there's a lot of energy around that. Um, and so in recently in the UK, I've been working with quite a lot of these groups. Um, and again, this is really, really hard. Uh, a lot of the, the investment managers who run the, the portfolios of, say, the universities, the big, the big university endowments that have a lot of money, are very conservative, um, frequently do not want to move, or they definitely don't want to move their money out of their big, big uh, fossil fuel companies. Um, and it's a, this is a really cool campaign for students to get involved in. Um, very challenging, though. Uh, but there's been some, some sort of successes coming through. Um, and I guess what... But it's at the, the, the student fossil fuel divestments at a quite an early stage. So actually right now what we're trying to do is to actually get better arguments going, um, get a lot more sort of technical arguments about why um, investors should divest from fossil fuels, but also to perfect the moral arguments, to, to, to create the sort of the balance between... Um, because if you're trying to convince, a, say, a, a big investor to get out of fossil fuels, there's lots of different ways you could do it. You could either argue that it's economically unsound to be invested in fossil fuels, or you could be arguing that it's morally unsound. And you're trying to trying to combine those different types of arguments is is um, is quite is quite interesting. Um, so, uh, for yeah, so we we can talk more about this these types of campaigns because they're getting quite big. Um, uh, another campaign I've been working on um, is around tax havens. This is a huge area of the financial markets, which is um, offshore finance. Um, do you guys know much about offshore finance? Have you heard much about tax havens and things? Okay, so very secretive. Um, well, the, the use of places, places like the Cayman Islands to, to uh, create companies and steer financing through as a way to avoid tax. 
Um, now, this is a bit of a jumbled slide here. It's not very self-explanatory. I've been working with ActionAid UK, which is a big NGO in the UK. So we were working on stuff around Mauritius as a tax haven and all the investment that flows via places like London through Mauritius into various African countries. Uh, and that's deliberately do that as a way to avoid certain types of tax. Um, it's technically often legal to do it, um, but it's, it's, it's very unsound in many, in many ways. The, these companies can abuse a lot of, a lot of these elements um, or abuse a lot of international laws as a way to avoid basically... Um, well, they want to extract resources and things from these countries, but don't want to actually pay much tax in the process. So it's a very unequal power dynamic. Um, but a large part of this is it's trying to actually see what companies are doing, because it's incredibly hard. It's incredibly non-transparent. Actually trying to find the information about this involves a lot of investigation. What I tend to do in, in some of my stuff is, uh, because I've worked in the financial sector, I'm quite, I'm sort of, I act as an intermediary. I kind of go and talk to people who are involved in setting up tax havens and stuff, and I try and get information, and I work with uh, on, the, on the dark side, as it were. Um, so I work with groups like this, helping them get information, um, trying to figure out what's happening. Um, so that's and then this over here, just as as a slide, uh, is actually a group called Open Corporates in London, and they've just done this of Goldman Sachs, um, and uh, this is a uh, Goldman Sachs by number of, of subsidiaries it has, subsidiary companies. So Goldman Sachs has this number of companies in the US and this number of companies in the Cayman Islands. And there's reasons why Goldman Sachs has that number of companies in the Cayman Islands. Um, and things like that, that's like Bermuda there. So you can see the sheer number of companies that are started in these offshore tax havens is unbelievable. Um, Barclays was what uh, a company I was focusing on um, had something like 120 Cayman Islands subsidiaries. Um, and only 200 UK-based subsidiaries. And Barclays is a, is a British company. It has 200 subsidiaries in the UK and 120 in the Cayman Islands. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff on why these banks have so many offshore subsidiaries. Um, but that's, yeah, a, a very difficult and interesting area. This is a friend of mine called Paolo Surio. He's an Italian artist. He uh, hacked into the Cayman Islands company registry um, and started selling the companies off to people as a kind of artistic protest. <laughs> He's a very interesting guy. He was subsequently sued for this. Um, <laughs> and it was the, the idea was this was a kind of like a hacking thing. You know, we, it's like, well, I'm gonna, if, you, if you're going to have secretive companies in the Cayman Islands, I'm going to start selling, selling them to people. All right? And the, 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 the idea behind it is um, the, the reason that you set up a company in the Cayman Islands is that you don't want, you don't want anybody to know who owns it. All right? So he said, well, you can't prove that I don't own, own these companies because I've taken them from the Cayman Islands and I'm going to sell them to people unless you, unless you say who you are, basically. So it's a kind of a, like, a, like a hacking ethos behind this. Like he's trying to like mess with the principles of the system. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, he got in trouble for this though, but it's got a lot of awards. <laughs> um, the last uh, uh, camp, uh, sort of thing I've been working on, which I want to show, is more a... Um, transparency public data project <coughs> with a Berlin-based group called Open Oil. Um, we're basically going into big oil companies and trying to discover um, the financing inside oil companies. Um, now, one thing you should know about corporations is we talk about the financial sector, right? So that you know, big investors putting money into a corporation, um, but actually, corporations themselves are huge networks of subsidiaries. And all, so they, there's you know, something like, uh, well, I'll show you BP, but they're not, they're not, it's not a single company. It's like a thousand different companies all under one name. And internally, these companies have these huge financing systems where all the companies are lending each other money and investing in each other. Um, so actually trying to dig into the, inter, the corporate financing is a really interesting and hard, hard problem because there's very little information on in it. So... Um, so the first thing we're doing here, this is actually we're finding the BP shareholders. Look, BlackRock at the very top, the, the top shareholder in BP, um, a whole bunch of other ones, the People's Republic of China. and so. But then we're like, okay, so these are the shareholders in the company. Um, let's dig deeper. So if you own a BP share, uh, what do you actually own? So you own a share of something called BP PLC, which is a company registered in the UK. Okay, so you own a little percentage owner, uh, uh, ownership of, of, the, of that if you own one of those the shares. Um, 
But what does that mean? BPPLC itself has about 35 subsidiaries, right? So it owns all of these things now. All right, I've only written some of them there. Um, so these are its first subsidiaries. Now those subsidiaries themselves own all of those there. So it's actually 1,100 different companies. All right, so if you basically invest in that share there, you're going into this huge network of companies all around the world. All right, and then these companies themselves are all get, the, the money is coming in via BPPLC, and then it's being steered around this whole network of companies. Um, and let's just take one little strand of companies out of there. Um, so here's one, one of those many strands. Um, so BPPLC owns BP Global Investments Limited, which owns BTC Pipeline Holding Company, which owns BP Pipelines, which owns something called the Baku Tlebisi Sehan Pipeline Companies in the, in the Cayman Islands. All right, do you know what's at the end of that? Uh, that's, that's what is at the end of that company chain. Okay. Um, so the Cayman Islands company owns this. All right, which is in Azerbaijan and other Central Asian countries. Okay, so it's quite interesting. That's, that's basically one of those little strands uh, that you get as a BP shareholder. You're going down to that level there. Another one of these strands here, you can see, this is by the Canadian, a Canadian branch. Um, it goes via the Netherlands. You can see the Netherlands is another tax haven. There's a reason why they steer it via the Netherlands. Um, and this is going to the Sunrise Oil Sands project. This is a new oil, big oil sands project that BP is developing. So this is kind of the physical reality of what your share in BP actually ends up at via all these, these company structures. Um, so this is what, so basically Open Oil, the project we're trying to do is we're trying to like take all this company data, open it up and actually sort of find ways of displaying it. It's actually really, really hard because obviously there's a lot of data to get. And there's also how do you actually present data to the public in a way that's meaningful? Um, so we're still working on it. So we're actually developing a whole platform right now, which is supposed to try to visualize it and um, find different ways of making it, um, showing the human stories behind um, the finance. Um, and then this, the last slide here, this is a new, a new thing I'm starting here called the London School of Financial Activism, which is basically um, getting young activists who want to work on issues around finance and uh, giving training and getting sort of cool projects together. So that's my next big, my next big project is trying to get this up and running. Um, so uh, you can go check it out. It's got a website I've just put up. Um, also my blog and Twitter profile there if you want to check it out. Um, so I thought I'd end there, but let's maybe go to questions about, uh, we've got, a, I guess, half an hour or something for questions. Is that cool? Um, we can explore whatever different strands you want. Or any comments or whatever, your personal experiences. I have a few questions because when you say I have been into it or I've been working it, what so do you. Say, say it, it works now? Yeah. yeah. When you say it several times, I have been working as a broker or I've been done this or this, do you mean you entered it uh, intellectually or you have done the work? I mean. Uh, I worked as a broker, yeah. You worked as a broker. You have been with a company or isn't, isn't it very difficult to to get into such a job or you did it just because to find out something or to yeah yeah well i guess that's uh, the um the interesting part of my story is i'm often described actually i think in, in the in the program i'm described as a former stockbroker turned activist yeah. um actually it's the other way around it's it's more <laughs> activist turned broker um back to activist so and it's a, it's a, it's a difficult it's a slightly different concept to um there's a there's a word in the in the UK that's used a lot which is called reformed bankers <laughs> right people who leave the banking sector to quote unquote become good mm -hmm. um but actually it's it's got nothing to do with what my my thing is I mean, my my the kind of stuff that I work with stuff like London School of Financial Activism is about actually getting activists to sort of for want of a better word, infiltrate the financial system and actually find out interesting stuff and, and do interesting things in the financial system. But do you see it as good and bad? Do no, you have no, to no, use I don't see it. No, that, no. Not, not at all? Or, uh, well, good and bad. Well, sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, because you said good, be becoming, become, being on the right side and then turning to, the, to the wrong side. No? Yeah, I, I don't see that at all. So, so, so one thing which I'm always talking about in the financial sector is 
there's no point trying to uh, make claims about the people in the financial sector. The people are just ordinary people. There are people like anybody else, like any sector. The, the real issues of the financial sector are not about the people. It's yeah. about the, the structures and the way that, the, that, it's, that it's arranged. Um, so actually, a lot of people in the financial system are not particularly, they're very normal uh, um, and well, often pretty, pretty nice people. Um, the, the real issue is how the financial system is able to bring, is, is able to, to bring out the negative potentials in people, is able to bring out the worst parts. So is that you what you're asking? Sorry. Yeah, but don't you think that the system as a whole is, has the aim of shifting, for example, shifting properties from one section of the oh, yes. of society oh, yes, to yes. the other section of society? Yeah, the system as a whole is very toxic. Yes, yeah, but that's so that's, that's, that's a, that's a so different. If you're in, but so if you are in the system, you are doing a toxic work. Yep, uh, yeah. Yeah. Am I right, or do you see it like that? Well, yeah, y you are, but you wouldn't necessarily perceive yourself as doing that. Most people who work in the financial system do not perceive themselves as, as actually doing that. I'm just asking yeah. you. No, I wouldn't perceive my, No, I mean, like, when I was working, I didn't perceive that, no. Mm -hmm. uh, but also bear in mind that the, the financial system has... Um, there's many very valid roles that it has. So for example, pension savings. There's nothing particularly wrong about pension savings. Yeah. The, the, real, the real issues about finance are often about the, the extremes and the... And, uh, so there, there, is a, there is a useful core there. Yes. And it's, it's more about... Um, and so a lot of people in the financial sector think, oh, we're actually, we're doing a useful role. We're, we're facilitating somebody's retirement savings. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so it's it's more about the structural yeah, issues. But I, but I agree with you because yeah. it it seems all very rational. No, it seems all 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 together. It seems quite useful. Yeah, yeah. But one has to know that, for example, the the derivate, uh, the derivate trade is mm. ten times higher. As the the cross the world cross product. The world cross product product is sixty sixty five. You yeah, say billions? Yeah. Here we say billions, it is trillions, no? Mm. And the derivative market is 600. So the bets are 10 times higher than the whole production of the whole world. Yeah. So if it's, this is not insane, I don't know what is insane. <laughs> so exactly, the, the point is that the financial sector has become incredibly speculative and actually most of the work it's doing isn't particularly useful. So. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the whole financial system is, no. is, is, is you know, so, so the, the, the dynamic there is that the finan people who work in the financial sector can still claim that they're doing useful work, even though most of it is actually bullshit. So. Can I have one, <laughs> one question more? Because, there is, yeah. because it is said that the London market, the London city, in 90%, it is dealing within themselves. So there is yeah, no yeah, there yeah. is no connection with the with the production sector with the with the first uh, first level of, of production and so on. Yeah, yeah. So only ten percent. It was mentioned because whether Britain should be in the in the European Union or not. Mm. So there was a great fear if Britain turns out, so it will be a great loss. But then it turned out only ten percent of the city is ta is market making market with uh, with production. So you can really forget it. It doesn't have any. It does really have no impact yeah. on European <coughs> market. So, and and since if you only trade within yourself, within this yeah. quite small so, so group of some thousand things. An interesting new tools. a new thing is stuff like high frequency trading, for example. I don't know if you guys have heard of high frequency trading, which is basically computerized trading, yeah. which is going on and on. Like, and for example, in foreign exchange markets, there's huge amounts of foreign exchange which get thrown around high frequency trading. Um, the thing is, is that actually the real end market in foreign currency is much, much smaller. Yeah. Okay, but in, in between, uh, there's so much speculative activity that's going on in between that it looks like there's much more activity than there actually is. Um, so, sure. like the actual end, re the, you know, the, 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 there are international companies who need to use foreign currency markets, but the biggest players now are basically these hedge funds that have automated, automated. Um, uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of froth and and speculative activity but there's still there's still a debate on whether that's what degree of speculation in financial markets is, neg is negative versus positive um, for example if you are working in, if you are if you work in any market um, some degree of speculation can be useful to get things moving so like let's say about 30 20 percent or something like that but when when your level, levels of speculation make up about 90 percent of the market it's become completely irrational Anybody else? Sorry. 
Yeah, sure. uh, just two little questions and, and second, actually the third one, a little bit longer one. What was the first moment when you realized that actually financial sector is complete bullshit and you want to quit? Was it a single, single moment of enlightenment or uh, it took you longer? Where did you work? Well, I, actually, I who did you I work for? I haven't realized that though. So, so, so what was it? Okay. Uh, yeah, th that was my question. Was it a single, single moment after a couple of years of, you know, coming over to the city in the suit and and spending time with your colleagues, or maybe you were just enlightened by one conversation or, or colleague of you, or you were just fed no, up? No, no. The thing about the financial system is that when you actually work in the financial system, it all seems quite reasonable and rational. Actually, it's more like the the, the further you are you are away from it, the more likely you are to have a critique of it. So the more you go inside, people often often say, oh, actually it's not as bad as I thought, thought it was and so on. So it has a way of, like, like any cultural system, it has a way of rationalizing itself internally, especially if you're around all sorts of people who say the same thing. So th this is how a lot, a, lot, a lot of bankers don't understand why people are angry. It's like, well, I, you know, all my friends don't seem to, you know, my social yeah. networks don't say the same thing. So you can uh, have a different morality emerging in, the, in those, those communities. Um, and uh, so, but yeah, but I would say actually like what, what came out of my experience wasn't so much some new damning critique of the financial system. It was more a realization of how utterly compli complicated the issue is of how you would actually try to change it. It wasn't some kind of big thing of like, um, or it's more like the, the trade-offs. You know, you can try to change one thing, but then something else changes. So an example in financial markets is something like deposit insurance. Um, so you guys know deposit insurance, like back in the, the 1930s where the, the government said, okay, we're going we're gonna to guarantee your deposits when you put, I'm not sure if it's uh, how it is in Poland, but if you put your money in a bank, we will guarantee it. Okay? So you could say that, that came out as partially as a result of banks, of governments trying to protect people being screwed over by banks. But as a result people themselves who have deposit insurance don't keep track of their banks and actually become very complacent. And actually the banks themselves have become unaccountable. So there's a, there's a trade-off at play there. And actually there's no, the, the, the real key with financial regulation is trying to actually balance these different types of things off against each other. It's very seldom that there's one perfect thing that works mm -hmm. for, for everything. So I guess that's more what came out. Um, I guess what I also really realized is, is how little people in the financial sector actually know about finance. Um, or actually about the economy or how things actually, a lot of people who work in the financial sector actually don't understand stuff like agriculture or don't understand what money is. There's a very um, abstract notion of how the economy works when, you, when you're in those systems. So that's a very worrying thing. Bankers and especially investment bankers perceive that what they do is very important, not because it actually is important, but because those, those jobs historically have been given very high status. Um, so... Uh, you know, they they think they view stuff like farming as like, oh, it's some shitty thing that some people do. It's like below me, basically. Because um, if you look at what, how people in the financial sector make so much money, it's because it basically extracts rent from so many other layers of the economy. All right. So if you're if you're very high up on the the, the economic, if you're you're at the top of the, the economic thing, you can basically scrape little bits of money of everyone else. Okay, so and that's why you know, things like hedge fund managers, for example, are not making money because they're particularly skilled. They're making money because they can extract huge amounts of rent from all the other layers. Um, so incredibly wealthy hedge fund managers cannot exist without all those other much more basic economic activities occurring. Um, but of course, if you are making such huge amounts of money, your, your opinion of yourself gets very inflated and you start to think that you're very important and it's like you must be the core of the economy and finance must be the center of everything. Um, so there's a big ideology in the financial sector that, you know, the economy would collapse without us. We're basically what drives everything, um, even though it's the other way around. Um, you know, you, you could remove, if you took plumbers out of society for a week, the society would collapse. But if you took traders out, nothing would happen. Uh, <laughs> just a quick one on, uh, on the campaign on tax havens. Yeah. Because for, for me, it's absolutely outrageous that since the crisis, correct me if I'm wrong, since the crisis, not, not much change actually. And if you think of that, it's, it's one of the pretty easy source of collecting the money. Uh, instead of raising the taxes, you can actually make sure that companies pay taxes. Uh, and personally, I haven't seen massive changes since the crisis. So my question is whether it changed, because obviously you're involved in the topic and, and you run the campaign, mm -hmm. at least in the UK. Uh, and if it didn't, 
which I presume it didn't. Why? <laughs> well, any campaign doesn't, in and of itself, change the world necessarily. Are you part of a broader, a broader strategic um, political process? So something like, for example, the Action Aid campaign on Barclays was to try and drive the political debate in the in the UK. So they're focusing on Barclays. Not because they thought Barclays, changing Barclays itself was going to make a big difference, but because it's going to influence the political debate. Um, so, <coughs> but the issue of tax havens is incredibly hard because basically you're having to try and deal with what's happening is, is individual companies are using national sovereignty laws um, against, against other countries. So, uh, and because nobody in the world wants to breach national sovereignty, it's very, very hard to deal with. So Mauritius says... We're we're uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna put all these laws in place, which basically mean that if you're a foreign investor, you pay no tax at all. And of course, no country can tell Mauritius that they're not allowed to do that because they have national sovereignty. So what the countries can do is try to regulate from their sides, you know. But then they they're under pressure from their business elites to say, well, uh, you know, we quite we actually quite like having a, a loophole um, to India via Mauritius. Um, at the same time, uh, there's a lot of work that's been, that actually works. Like for India, for example, um, for a while, something like 40% of foreign investment into India went via Mauritius, purely because of the tax loopholes. And actually, India said, the Indian government was like, no, we're not going to allow this anymore. And they clamped down upon it and just stopped it. They, they closed, they, they, they axed the tax treaty between the two countries. Um, and that was because of various political pressures and a variety of different campaigns and things. So you can change stuff, but it depends on... Uh, changing the entire global tax haven system is pretty difficult. One, th there's there's a lot of geopolitical issues with that because, for example, the United States has been a big. Um, the United States government after the 9/11 basically issued something called the Patriot Act, which is all about trying to stop uh, terrorist financing. That was the ostensible reason it was to stop terrorist financing. But one of the one of the big hidden agendas behind the Patriot Act was to try and uh, clamp down on tax evasion. Because uh, they were demanding financial records from everyone around the world. Because um, they realized so many of the American companies were evading tax. Um, so there's different national governments who have different agendas. I, that didn't quite answer your question about how you solve it, but absolutely, it's a, it's a, it's a. But you having to deal with it on different national bases. Uh, but there's a very good campaign in the, U, in the, in the UK called uh, the Tax Justice Network, who do a lot of good technical work around uh, alternative policies, and they've they've done quite well in actually getting getting their policies heard. So go check them out. Um, I have a question about uh, derivatives markets, uh, derivatives commodities markets, because you said that you are somehow involved in the subject. Um, specifically, could you tell us how it affects people's lives? If uh, what is the the connection between the operations at a very abstract level of the derivatives and our lives? Okay, so. Um the campaign that I was involved in with commodity markets was run by a group called the World Development Movement, um, WDM. It's a London-based NGO um, who ran a campaign against food speculation, basically trying to stop people betting on uh, food derivatives, so agricultural derivatives, basically say you know, um, things like corn futures um, and soybean futures. and oh, I didn't really explain futures, but basically betting on these, on these food markets. Um, and uh, uh, one of the real complexities of, of this is that in traditional financial theory, um, there's a claim that derivative markets cannot affect the prices of the real world. So uh, conceptually, it's basically, th basically saying that horse bets cannot influence the outcome of a horse race. It's only the horse race that can influence the outcome of, of what the bet is, right? And that makes sense in various ways. Now, what the what what the the claim of people who who are talking about in the, in, uh, that I'm involved with was that there's so much money going into the derivative markets from, say, banks and big investors like pension funds that actually it's it's actually disconnecting from the real world and it's subsequently influencing real world the real world prices of the, of the things that they're betting on. Now, in the financial establishment, this is like. You know, they're, they're, that, they're, it's all like, oh, that doesn't, that doesn't correspond with our textbook theory of how the markets actually work. But lots of traders um, who are involved in those markets will definitely say that that's how it actually works. Um, so, for example, um, investment banks design these um, what are called structured products. 
Okay, so let's say you're an you're a investment bank, so you've got Goldman Sachs, and you make money of getting clients to trade with you right, or to, to enter into these products. So what you, what you do, you... Um, it's hard to explain this. Um, you basically create a product that a, a pension fund, a big institutional investor like a pension fund, can quote-unquote invest in It'll basically be that they, they put money into a fund, which Goldman Sachs then goes and uses to con continually enter into bets in the derivative markets, so buy futures over and over again. Okay, so, and uh, channel the returns from those futures markets out to the investor. Okay, so they create these conduits for huge pension funds to basically bet in these markets on, on stuff like agricultural commodities. And the reason why they say you should do that is they go to these big these fund managers and say, you, you're managing all this money for pension pensioners. Um, you've got some of it in the stock market. You've got some of it in bond markets. You might have some in property. You, you've you spread it around. Why don't you further diversify your risk? Okay, Put it into something new. Put it into commodities. You haven't got any commodities yet. So why don't you buy this new commodity investment product of, us, of ours, which is basically... Um, based on these derivatives. Um, so, that, so there's huge amounts of this money coming in via these pension funds and other investors into those markets. Um, and uh, that's called food speculation. Um, and the, the big concern is that that actually uh, uh, causes food, the, the, the derivative prices to rise and then real world contracts between farmers are often uh, referenced to the futures markets prices. So they, when, they're dealing with, when they're entering into contracts with each other, when they're trying to agree prices, they look to the futures markets, with, say the big New York exchanges, and they say, well, that's the price on, on the corn futures exchange. Let's base our contract off that price. So there's these ways for these derivative prices to infiltrate into the, into the world. So, so it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. Like so, uh, there's a lot of complexity to it as well, though, because there's lots of things that affect prices. Um, but the basic claim is that the more financial investors you get coming into this the more dislocation and the more the, the prices have a tendency to be pushed upwards or at least for downward pressure to be to, to be um or downward moves in the prices to be resisted so it kind of like adds this buoyancy to 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 food markets now of course if you you know people like in, in the western world frequently have enough money to deal with a, a small changes in food prices but if you if you're in developing countries a large part of your disposable income goes onto food so you are very disproportionately hit by this kind of thing um of course the financial lobby is is, is gone big against trying to claim this doesn't have any impact on 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 the, the markets but the world development movement um was very successful uh, uh barclays for, for, for a start stopped stopped facilitating this because of the reputational damage that was happening they they pulled out of commodity commodity markets um they've actually disbanded the entire commodity team um and there's a, there's a lot of new laws going into the eu now about um trying to curb the speculation so there's been some successes in that campaign um but it's quite it's quite complicated to, to go into the details Nobody really likes to pay tax, for example, but it's all about who has to pay the most relative to other people. Um, and actually, the, the frequently the burden lands on those who are not able to use the law and who are not able to use the international system. So there's this natural disparity. Um, in terms of like how the currency markets come to play into that, I mean, that's a whole other question. I mean, if I got you... You were going on the the idea that a completely digital currency is makes everything a lot more trackable, and this is a big this is a big issue because there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, sort of banter and debate that goes around now about the, the cashless future. There'll be no cash in the future, and everything will be you know electronic money and so on. And it's a it's a horrible vision to me, because it it, it means basically every single transaction you do is visible to to the central intermediaries, i.e. the banks themselves. Um, and there's, there's a variety of psychological reasons why that's not cool as well. Um, so yeah, that absolutely, that's that's something that uh, you know is going to be fought out. But not only is it's not only going to be fought out in the, the realm of currency, but also in all sorts of other internet-based platforms. Um, something like the actual part of the, one of the interesting things about, about Bitcoin, the Bitcoin community, is I mean I have problems with Bitcoin in various ways. Um, I do use it, um, but one of the one of the, the definite positive things that it does do is it is a digital form of a, it's a digital currency, but one that actually allow it feels more like cash when you're using it. Um, I don't know how many of you have used Bitcoin, um, but it it feels like you're using cash, even though you're not. Like it's it's quite different to cash in many ways. But it, it it's it's 
if there was a purely digital world, I would want there to be things like Bitcoin there to keep my ability to, to have anonymous transactions. Because there's something about the ability to take normal cash and have anonymous transactions that's important to people. Having some degree of autonomy and some degree of flexibility and not having to report yourself all the time is actually very important. Did you get any, any formal education in economics, business or finance? No. no. Then did it help you? or? Uh, well, no, I studied anthropology and history. Yeah. So actually, my experience in the financial system was much more anthropological. I was, I was thinking about it like an anthropologist. Um, but actually, um, most, many people who are, who are hired by the financial industry are not, don't have degrees in finance or economics. Actually, economics as a discipline is not very useful at all for finance. Because finance is a practical industry. All right? And economics is an abstract discipline that tries to uh, apply um, archaic models to practical industries. And actually, it's not useful for the financial industry to have economists um, because f uh, people who are working in, say, bond deals, like there's nothing that an economist can tell them that's actually particularly useful. Um, so it's a very practical industry. Um, they do h banks do hire economists to do like macroeconomic mo modeling and sort of future forecasts, but that, that it's not very useful if you go down to say like trading and stuff. So um, uh, yeah, a lot of people who are hired actually have degrees in you know languages and uh, all sorts of stuff. It's uh, and part of that's because the financial industry in the UK is so big, it's so powerful and so big that actually there's not enough people who have degrees in finance to. You know, they don't, they're not really that interested in, in hiring. And actually, most of the jobs are... Uh, we want financial, part of the, the power of the financial sector is that it kind of like wants you to think it's really hard, right? That the jobs are really complicated and it's really difficult. And actually, most of the jobs are not that hard at all. Like, uh, something like being a nuclear physicist is probably quite hard. Something like doing engineering on a bridge is probably quite hard. But a lot of stuff like trading isn't technically that difficult. It could be done by quite a few different people. So a large part of like the sort of jargon and, and stuff around the finance is trying to kind of like pr you know, protect that sort of space that bankers have and financiers have. Um, which is why I really hate the term complex derivatives. People often say, oh, complex derivatives. But think about it. If I've worked in derivatives, as I have, every time somebody says complex derivative, who gets more powerful? How many people really need a knowledge of it? 10%, 5%? So, so what's the question? How many people need? You told us that a lot of the jobs are not very, do not need a, a real skill. Okay, so yeah. quite simple. As you, so you're, you're well, conquer. they need skill, but they don't need yeah, as much skill as they claim but, they do. But at least you need a certain, a certain percent of people who really have the skill. How yeah. much do you think it is? Uh, I mean, there's an increased uh, uh, use of quantitative analysis in financial markets. So these quants, and that, that requires engineering degrees and stuff like physics. Um, but quants themselves, are they've, become, they've got a lot more power in, in sort of, well, during the financial crisis, they had a lot of power because the, the quants were doing a lot of work around abstract, exotic financial products. Um, investment banks have tried to go back to slightly simpler products now. But for example, one of my, one of my, one of my good friends is a, is a quant. Um, and his basic role is to sit there, use, he's, he actually has a PhD in probability theory um, from a big American university. And his role was to, to, to sit and try and work out what the price of financial instruments were. They didn't know how to price them. So, they, so for example, the bank had entered into a kind of co a sort of a, 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 a um, combined deal where they put a few d different derivatives together to try and help, uh, to try and uh, uh, hedge some company's risk, but they don't know how to then actually price this thing that they've created. So the quants basically sit in the background and, and work on that. But that, that's, not the front, that's not the front line of, of finance. A lot of, the, a lot of the, the people working are not doing quantitative stuff all the time. Um, and actually, a lot of so the traditional vision of the investment banker, this kind of slick character, it's often about deal making. It's about dealing between people, getting people to, to, to enter into big deals. It's political. It's, 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 not a, it's not a technical job. It's a political job. Um, so they, they're trying to like, you know, get, get company executives to you know, uh, merge with each other. It's all about meetings and stuff. It's very human. Um, so in this contrast, the very mathematical idea people have of financial markets, finance, finance in the end is a very human um, social pr process. And the more you think that, actually the more, the more you f access you have to it. 
Um, the more you think that finance is this abstract mathematical thing, the further away it actually gets to you, and the harder it seems. Um, so, and just, just that thing I was going to say, every time somebody says about complex derivatives, I get more powerful. I'm the one who benefits from that, from that speech. It's not the public who benefits, benefits from that. So just bear that in mind. Uh, derivatives might be complex, but they're not that complex. You know, they're actually very understandable if you put your mind to it. Um, so, uh, I, I want to ask you a question about um, move your money, this, um, yep. this action, because this is something like uh, happened before with, uh, uh, with this idea that cost, uh, customers uh, can shape the world with their wallets, with their decisions, yes? Mm. And well, sort of, yeah. yeah. And it's with it, it's some companies are trying to answer and uh, sell fair trade, uh, fair trade tea, for example, McDonald's uh, sell fair trade tea yeah. or something like that. And do you think that I, I'm thinking what, what this action uh, is, is can change something uh, in real or 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 without state? Without state, uh, nothing will change. So generally, my question is about mm. uh, what state, uh, what is the role of the state? Yeah, yeah. Well, something like move your money is obviously not going to change the whole banking sector by itself again. So like, it's never made that claim. Um, if you really want large-scale reform, you tend to need state involvement and regulations and so on. But part, part, of the, part of the problem with state regulations and finance is that they can be reversed. You know, one government comes in there and say, oh, we're going we're gonna to cap bankers' bonuses and cap the amount of pay. Then the next government comes in and they reverse the same regulation. You still have some of the same fundamental problems. Um, part of the deepest problem is the power dynamic between ordinary people and the institutions. So something like Move Your Money, in some ways, one of these, at a surface level, it's a consumer movement to try and, you know, make the bank scared that people, people will leave the bank. But, but at a deeper level, what it's actually trying to do is to convince people that they have personal responsibility um, to try and activate a more active notion of yourself in an economy. That you're not just a passive, a passive person in an economy. You know, you're not just passively putting your money and then you don't know what happens. It's like it's saying that's not good enough. You should have to take responsibility and actually hold these. So there's a, there's a citizenship e element to this, trying to convince people that they are active participants. Um, of course, that, that's a, a, a long, hard process to get that mentality going. Um, you could imagine a society where everyone did perceive responsibility for what their money did would probably be quite different to a society where nobody perceived responsibility. So part of the, 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 the real issues in the banking sector is that nobody takes responsibility. You know, depositors don't take responsibility. And then people in the banks themselves say, oh, well, you know, my boss told me to do it. or you know, the, the regulator allowed me to do it. or you know, like uh, the accountant signed it off. There's all these different layers and ways of, of distributing responsibility and nobody wants to take it. So um, part of trying to these citizen movements to try and, you know, which, you know, do have this consumer element to them is trying to get a notion of active economic citizenship, if you want to call it that, um, that your actions have an impact um, further down the line. Of course, that by itself is not, is, is, you know, you need lots of different things to, to, to um, make a real difference. But the other, the other element of that as well, Move Your Money's secondary objective was also to try and stimulate the alternative finance sector. So on the one hand, it was about withdrawing money from the mainstream banks, but it was also about showing support to alternatives. To say, look, here, you know, you, if, you know, the problem about the small banks is that they don't get any support from society. So they stay small and they stay marginal and they don't, they're not, they, their quality doesn't go up because they're not forced to actually serve more people. So actually, move, move your money, one of the roles is to try and jack up the alternative finance sector, try to get more of these small banks, try to get more of these community type uh, um, banks, sustainable banks, um, and actually to demand higher service from them as well. So there's a variety of, 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 camp of elements there, but no, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, solve the, you, you need various forms of state involvement as well. Of course, you know. <laughs> uh, hi, I would like to come back to the issue of regulation you touched upon. Um, so my understanding was, or my, I know, when we look back uh, to 2008 and the collapse of the 
Lehman Brothers Bank. And then um, the financial crisis and um, the Occupy movement that criticized strongly the financial market and the economic market. And I, um, back then I was feeling that um, people were hoping for some stricter regulations or there was this time when people believed that now we can do something about the sector that was, uh, you know, and discovered to be, you know, unregulated and completely, um, yeah. um, you know, deregulating the economy. But um, I don't think much has happened. Or can you tell us some examples of some countries or regulations that has have yeah, been no put regulatory place? Regulatory, nothing's happened. <laughs> or um, it's interesting. Or has it mean something? Or maybe the opposite way, like maybe it's become more worse. That well, it's been. I don't. The, the thing is, like, I'm sensing that. Um, yeah, there was all this hope that. Yeah. Be so finally, the change, but. The political what will to try and do something about finance has definitely gone down. All right. So in the, in the, the wake of the crash, there was a lot of political talk about we need to do stuff. All right, and the Occupy movement added to that. So there was a kind of. Um, a lot of rhetoric around from politicians saying, "Oh, we're going to do something." You know, look, there's this, this is kind of stuff. And um, there were some some reforms brought in. I mean, in the states, they brought in reforms of the Dodd Dodd Frank Act, and there are some elements of that which were positive. Um, in the in the UK, they have brought in uh, laws around trying to separate investment banks from commercial banks. Um, so there there have been things that have happened, and there've been also stuff around caps on bankers' bonuses. But they're not things that fundamentally actually change the power dynamic in the financial sector that much. Um, and the problem now is that um, the political will to try and change anything is going down because that the crisis is getting further away. So a lot of politicians now don't want to actually engage with, with this type of stuff. So, and this is, this is natural in any kind of political cycles. You know, politicians go with what's currently hot and then they kind of like ease off it when it's no longer... Um, so, and, and, but for for my side, I don't necessarily mind that. The way I'm when I, when I'm thinking about financial reform, I'm often trying to think about it in a longer term. You know, actually, with a lot of activist groups I work with, a lot of activist groups get very caught up in the here and now. It's like let's respond to like what's happening right now, right now, right now, and then they don't feel like they know how to respond, and then it's like a lot of kind of like very quick rush start type of stuff. It happens. Um, and sometimes you, know, you can get reforms from that, but they tend to be quite shallow. And you know, I'm I'm much more interested in trying to like work on much longer term, deeper reforms, but to do it slower. So like have a sort of a horizon, well not that slow, but like a horizon of a, of a few years ahead. You know, several years ahead. Be thinking about okay, when's the next crash happening? How are you going to have stuff coming in at that point, rather than reacting to to crashes when they happen? Um, so my, you know, I, I tend to not focus on the the, the, the day to day, you know, um, controversies in the financial sector. I'm much more trying to focus on thinking for the future. Um, but that's, you know, it, it'll take lots of political struggle around the world to to change um, the world's most powerful industry. Yeah. I got another one, just a little bit connected to the one before. Uh, about the impact of the of the action of the Move Your Money action uh, campaign on the government in in the UK, I, I think that there was some kind of direct impact on on the government. On in the, the government, UK. yeah. I mean, there was some some act passed here. Yeah? Was there any? As a result of Move Your Money? Yeah. No, no. I mean, some politicians paid lip service to it and mentioned it, but I, I don't think it, it changed. There's, there's no regulations that have come around saying banks have to lend sustainably. Um, but no, the point, the, 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 the actual end goal of moving money didn't have an overt political policy agenda to it. It was more focused on people's personal behavior. I have one basic question. So why do you think that something should change? Who should bring up the reforms if the system as a whole is working perfectly well. So, because we have this 99-1% situation, and this 99-1% situation didn't change. So why is it in the hell they should change it? So, and so, if you earn, if you have a profit rate in the financial sector of roughly 25%, Deutsche Bank is counting with 25%, 26%. So if you earn in the, in the first sector, in the production sector, some 
perhaps two, perhaps four. So why in the hell you should invest in the, in the first sector if you are doing so well in the second one, in the financial one? So who should bring, bring along the reforms? Moreover, then, for example, Goldman Sachs, Draghi is, an, is, an old, is a Goldman Sachs man. I don't know, I don't see the primitive that he's on the, in the wage list of, of Goldman Sachs. But the, the former Italian minister, prime minister, was a Goldman Sachs man. The whole, the whole Greek government is a gold in, is in, was in the, in the Goldman Sachs. It's called uh, government uh, Sachs. And so on and so on. Yeah, but it is, they say, I think, say, uh, well, one can get really paranoia. <laughs> but, but the fact is that a lot of the people have a whole circle of people around that. So yeah. why in the hell they should produce any reform if the system for them is working perfectly well? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. We, uh, just, uh, a, just a short answer. Yes, I think I think that that question is is like uh, I mean I, I don't for a moment claim that uh, campaigning on these types of issues is is particularly easy or uh, it's incredibly hard and you have you you not only have an entire economy locked into this type of stuff but you have a huge political system which is complicit in the process so yeah like look it's it's very unlikely to uh, it's it's I, I don't think people should go into these types of campaigns thinking that they will easily win them. The point of these types of campaigns is that they're incredibly hard to win. Um, so I don't think we make that claim. Um, I mean, we have to close. So I, I, I realize that's not a very substantial answer to your, to your question. But one thing I want to say to people, to, to, to everyone, is that actually um, definitely, if you can, spend time looking at finance. I mean, finance is not the only thing in the world. There's, there's lots of other industries that are very powerful. Um, but if you re it's definitely, definitely worth t spending a few months or like spending like a, a substantial amount of time looking into finance and getting a sense for it and trying to start to, sen to, to see how it works because it, it'll be incredibly helpful for you no matter what you're doing. If you're working on any types of campaigns, it's always good to know this kind of stuff and how the banking system and, 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 um, uh, interacts with that. Um, t far too few activists actually and ordinary citizens far too few of them actually try and engage with the financial sector. And it's one of the reasons that the financial sector stays so powerful is that nobody tries to engage with it. Um, and we don't know the answers to how you solve this stuff yet, but it's not going to happen unless people actually go out and start to, to get creative about it. Um, so that's what my kind of my, the School of Financial Activism is about, is trying to sort of get a more creative uh, views on, on how you can start to mess around with the financial system and try and create cool stuff. Um, so hopefully that's given you some ideas. Um, and uh, yeah, if you know of any Polish campaigns that are going on, please get in touch and send me an email and, and I'll, I'll be cool to take a look at it um, or give you some help or whatever. Thank you for a very interesting discussion and um, see you next week. <laughs>